Kan dan men toch is. Ja. <laughs> So it's the first day back at school after the long summer break, and 1,200 AES students walk back through the school gates. But around the same time, over in Greenland, 12 billion tons of ice melted in 24 hours. Now, it's kind of hard to imagine what 12 billion tons of melted ice looks like, so I'll paint you a picture. It's the same amount of water it would take to cover the whole of Florida in five inches of water in a day. This is not normal. This is just an example of some of the changes that are happening all over the world right now, which should make us really prompt to think back on what's the path that we're on and what are the choices that we're making and what do we want to do about that? So... What's the path that brought me here? Well, it's the first day back of school after the long summer break. This is my school. And I'm happy to be back, but I'm thinking it's going to be maybe a bit boring today. We'll just be getting a ton of paperwork about our schedules, learning what we're going to be doing over the coming year. And sure enough, that's pretty much how the morning pans out. Because I'm 16 and I, I know it all. And then suddenly, after lunch, something different happens. I am just about to slip back into the bored teenager act that I've perfected in the morning, when suddenly this tall, skinny guy with a beard bursts in with a really unnecessary amount of energy, shouting, Come on, let's go, let's get on the bus, get on the bus! And before I quite know what's happening, we're blazing out of the school gates with a flagrant disregard for school procedure and the national speed limit until we pull over at this beautiful valley with steep hills in front of us. It's a place I know well from hiking and mountain biking. And Mr. Worrell, the teacher, says, what do you see? So we try and describe the landscape as best we can, throwing in some unnecessarily long words and random environmental terms because we're smart as 16-year-olds and that's our job. But Mr. Worrell very gently sets us straight on our sketchy grasp of geomorphology, and then he moves on to his follow-up question, which is, why does it look this way? Now, this is a little tougher, but, you know, undeterred, we offer some half-baked theories, um, and then he finally reveals the truth, which is these hills that we are looking at is actually an ancient coral reef. And what we're standing in used to be a tropical lagoon. Now, this blows my 16-year-old mind, because I'm thinking, wait, what? What happened to the tropical lagoon? We could be scuba diving right now and, you know, sipping on cocktails. But then what Mr. Worrell goes on to say really hooks me. And this is that these slow, gradual processes of, of environmental change that took us from a tropical lagoon to what we see today that took millions of years, whereas now we're seeing disruptive, rapid, human-induced climate change, which is acting on the system in such a way that it just can't really keep up. It can't cope. And change can, in one place can radiate through a very delicately balanced environmental system, causing change to spin out of control in all kinds of unexpected ways. This did not sound good. So I've had many influential moments in my life, but I can really track back to that day out with Mr. Worrell, first day of school, when I really found my purpose, which was really trying to better understand the environment and figuring out better ways that we could actually take care of it. And I just remember feeling these two feelings of excitement and anger at the same time. I was excited because I'd really found something I was passionate about. At the same time, I was really angry about the fact that we were abusing our environment in this way. It just made no sense. And 16-year-olds like to be angry about stuff, right? But I really felt that this was something that was worth fighting for. So I've been lucky. I found that purpose, and I've managed to pretty much focus on that ever since in various different guises that have taken me to all kinds of exciting places. So four years after that, fieldwork trip with Mr. Worrell. 
I find myself on my knees in a Canadian forest uh, sampling vegetation as a field worker. And I was working on part of a team trying to figure out better ways of understanding what was going on in the forest so it could be managed more productively and more sustainably. And this was real boys' adventure stuff. This was like living the dream for me. You know, we were living in these rope remote uh, logging camps, cooking over open fires, uh, swimming in lakes to get clean at the end of the day, and carrying big knives to sample vegetation with. It was just fantastic. And I really felt like I was doing something worthwhile. And I learned a heck of a lot about trees. And that came in handy later on when I was lucky enough to be working on the, the deforestation issue in Brazil, skimming over the canopy of the Amazon rainforest in a little six-seater aircraft, trying to work out better strategies for avoiding this kind of clearance. Because we all got used to the idea of the Amazon being termed the lungs of the world. It plays such a vital role in processing carbon dioxide, and frankly, if we don't take care of it, we stop breathing. And right now, I'm working here in India on other aspects of the climate issue, trying to work with partners who are finding fantastic ways to transition into cleaner sources of power, renewable energy, to help chart a path to a greener, cleaner future. Really inspiring stuff. But I wanted to back up a little way back in my career when I was working as a researcher, out, and I found myself bouncing around in the back of a truck in the semi-desert areas of Senegal in West Africa. And I was on a research project there, trying to understand how herders and farmers were adapting to the challenges of environmental change and a modernizing world. Now, this was more boys' adventure stuff. Uh, we were out in trucks, out in the bush. We were sleeping under the stars with nomads. We were trying to escape from bushfires quite regularly and carrying even bigger machetes this time to hack through thorny bushes. You can see a little trend there with things that I enjoy. Um, but what was different here was I'd, up until that point, I was really focused on the environment. And what I learned out here in West Africa was that people and poverty were a big deal. So what I was learning was that very poor communities, very poor people, can be the smartest and the most resourceful you will ever find on the planet. They are masters of using scarce resources to adapt to environmental change and various other pressures to make themselves less exposed, less vulnerable, and more sustainable. They are the masters of adaptation. But what I also realized was that poor people, just by definition, have less resources to cope when you hit an emergency or a big challenge. And what I was hearing time and time again was that these really severe droughts that used to happen you know, once in a lifetime were happening once a year. And there are limits to what people can adapt to. Now, you can see here the way used people sometimes used to get around. But actually, if you were in one of these things, you were doing pretty well. Most of the time, you were walking under the hot sun for miles and miles just to take care of your normal livelihood, to get from A to B. And we were in a truck traveling around the district, talking to herders and farmers. And we used to give people rides all the time if we used to pass them in the bush. And one day, we gave a ride to a young woman. She was about my age, early 20s at the time. And she was clearly very sick. And we did the best we could. We got her to the next village. But then I learned later on she didn't make it. And I asked my friend what happened, and he very gently pointed something out to me that I've never forgotten, which was he said, well, the thing is, Dan, she didn't die because she was sick. She died because she was poor. Now, I said earlier that I found my purpose on the side of a hill in the north of England, and that is partly true. But I think I found the other complementary part of my purpose out here in the tough semi-desert areas of Senegal. That's where I really learned that people matter. Poverty matters. Because poverty reduction and climate change are the two big challenges of our generation, and they're very closely interlinked. And if we fail on one, we will fail on the other. 
So we need to figure this out. We need to take some action on this. And we need a solution for everyone, not just the people that can afford it. Because climate change is going to hit poor people hardest. And there's some pretty scary predictions out there of what might happen in the very near future unless we fail to act. We could see 600 million more people going hungry, suffering from malnutrition. And let's not forget, that is on top of the one in nine people that right now, tonight, will go to sleep hungry. We could also see 2.5 billion people without adequate access to water, and these radically changing weather patterns can really make incredibly detrimental changes throughout the system, making some areas so risky, it may be just impossible to live in them anymore. And we could see 300 million people displaced by flooding because of rising sea levels. There are also threats to our health, to our national security, to our vital infrastructure. There's a whole load of things that we really need to be taking some attention to. And if, like me, you're also interested in nature, then check this out. Heat waves, rising sea temperatures are turning coral into ghosts. Mass coral bleaching has already destroyed 90% of the coral on a 1,500-kilometer stretch of the Great Barrier Reef. Now, while we're paying attention and feeling slightly scared, um, my suggestion here is this is not inevitable. I actually think that with the right kind of cooperative action, we can relegate that kind of bleak future to the dystopian fiction section of the AES library. Now, we've got a pretty strong incentive to act. Like Mr. Worrell told me all those years ago, if you have change in one part of the system, it can radiate through and affect people everywhere. So we all have a stake in this. It's affecting us all. So we all need to be involved in developing solutions because we really need to make climate change everybody's business. It's no longer just the preserve of eco-warriors and scientists. This is about businessmen and bankers and engineers, farmers, the guys that keep the lights on. It's not an environmental issue anymore. It's not a niche issue. It's about reimagining and re-engineering our entire economy, our entire way of life. And that is the really exciting career prospect that I want to offer you today. Because the simple fact is that whatever your passion, whatever your purpose, whatever you get excited about inside school or outside, you can relate that to solving these huge challenge of how we can build better quality lives, but while preserving a better quality of environment. So if you're into science, that's fantastic. You can be the person that innovates the next new generation of renewable energy technology or how to grow more crop per drop. If you are a maths geek or a computer nerd, I love you guys. We're going to need you to develop the kind of smart systems and software to stop wasting resources. And if you love the maker space, you should be coming right here because you are going to be building the cities of the future. Imagine apartment blocks with vertical farms up the sides and rainwater harvesting and every reflective surface of that building absorbing sunlight and converting it into electricity so that whole building turns into a self-sustaining power system. If you can imagine it, you can make it. And if you are into English, poetry, arts, social studies, don't think for a second this is not about you. Because you understand how to connect with people emotionally. And unless you connect emotionally, people don't change their behavior. They don't do, do things differently. We're going to need the people who can tell the stories that will make people change what they are doing and decide to do things in a more sustainable way. So what I'm saying is there are unlimited pathways in front of you that you can pursue to help contribute towards making a cleaner, greener future. So the only really question you need to ask yourself is, what are you passionate about? What makes you angry? 
Where do you want to apply your skills? How do you want to devote your energy? Because it's the first day of school. After the long summer break, 2030, and you pull up in your big car and you're picking your son up from school and he runs out and he's kind of excited to see you because he's had a kind of a boring day. They're just handing out schedules, telling him what he was going to do the rest of the year. And he jumps in the car and he says, hey, Dad, what did you make today? And you turn around and say, hey, son, today I made $50 million in two hours. And you give each other lots of high fives and you rush back to your big gated community that's keeping all the climate refugees outside. Is that you? Is that your idea of success? And is that the world that you want to live in? Because it's the first day back at school after the long summer break and the electric driverless bus pulls up outside your live workspace and it's fully Wi-Fi enabled. The kids are all doing their homework and it's made of a lightweight, completely recyclable alloy and it runs on a battery that goes for 500 kilometers without a charge, and it's charged by solar. And you know that, because you own the company that designed that bus. And your daughter runs in, and she's all excited, because she started a really great green engineering class at school, and it was taught by this tall, skinny guy with a beard that had some really inspiring ideas. And she says, hey, Mom, what did you make today? And although it's kind of cheesy, you turn and say to her, you know what? Today, hopefully, I made a difference. Thank you, AES. Thank you, Mr. Worrell.